On Tech News Today, Russian media gets hammered, Amazon gets a game controller, and Asus Tech gets pressured to drop its dual boot Windows Android tablet. All that and more coming up next. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. It's Friday, March 14th, 2014, and this is Tech News Today. This episode of Tech News Today is brought to you by Shutterstock.com. With over 30 million high-quality stock photos, illustrations, vectors, and video clips, Shutterstock helps you take your creative projects to the next level. For 20% off your new account, go to Shutterstock.com and use our offer code TNT314. And by ShareFile, enhance your workflow, send files of almost any size easily and securely with ShareFile by Citrix. Try ShareFile today for a 30-day free trial. Go to ShareFile.com and click the microphone and enter TNT. Welcome to Tech News Today. I'm Mike Elgin. And I'm Jason Owl. On Tech News Today, we explore the big stories of the day in conversation with some of the world's best journalists. Our guest co-anchor today is Dwight Silverman, tech blogger for the Houston Chronicle. Welcome, Dwight. Welcome. Thanks for having me, Mike. Well, today is a very special day for two reasons. First, it's Pi Day, so the mathematical uh, number Pi, uh, and it's also Bake a Pie Day. And uh, I personally think this should be a national holiday combining the two. What do you think? Oh, absolutely. Well, I think it kind of is, at least in the, in the minds of, uh, of geeks everywhere. The two are hopelessly entwined. Um, I know that at South by Southwest, they were uh, spelling out pi or running out the numbers of pi in um, uh, in skywriting, so um, it's being celebrated in proper ways all over the world. I'm going to have pi this evening, so that sounds like a circular argument. Uh, the other big <laughs> news today, uh, and it's very very big news around here at Twit. Our own director of engineering, Radford, and his wife had a baby named Olivia, and we congratulate Radford on that, and we look forward to her getting her own show in the next couple of weeks. <laughs> Well, media websites in Russia are having a bad week. They're under attack both by hackers and also by the Russian government, allegedly. A local anonymous branch is allegedly DDoSing Russian media outlets as well as Russian government and central banks. These attacks follow government crackdowns on media sites critical of Russian President Vladimir Putin. Now, this is a, a, a quite a quite an interesting uh, uh, story. Um, it's just the whole internet and the media scene in Russia is just kind of on fire right now. Uh, an anonymous um, uh, out, outlet called Anonymous uh, Cauc uh, Caucasus uh, put it. Uh, they're called the Electronic Army of the Caucasus uh, em Emirate. Uh, they claimed responsibility for the attack on their Facebook page with a statement that said, "Quote: This is just warming up, Russian pig." Unquote. Well, that's not very nice. Uh, this is this is quite an interesting thing, in, in part because the Russian government is denying almost every aspect of this story. They're saying that the attacks on the Russian government and central bank, which are happening, uh, as well as the media sites, are not the result of their activity in uh, in the Ukraine in Ukraine, and they're also denying that they are behind the attacks uh, going in the other direction, uh, even though some in the government have apparently. Uh, kind of admitted it. Um, is this is this the future, uh, Dwight, of, uh, of kind of cyber warfare internally for political reasons, do you think? Well, I think that you're going to see all kinds of attacks coming from all different places at all uh, different kinds of sites. And in, in the case of Russia, where there's a lot of factionalism, um, you know, it's not necessarily clear that the central government controls uh, all the branches of the sub-government. So while one group may be saying, hey, we're not, we don't have anything to do with it. You know, another group is actively doing these attacks or at least aiding uh, uh, partisans in doing the attacks. Um, you know, it's kind of the Wild West in, uh, in that part of the world in terms of the Internet, and it always has been. You know, that's where most malware comes from. That's where a lot of, um, a lot of other types of attacks on sites around the world uh, originate, and it's kind of just not a surprise, I think. I think, however that um, as more and more people see that this is a way to really bring an opponent down uh, or somebody they simply don't like, uh, you'll see more and more of this everywhere. I think that's absolutely right. And it's interesting that the, uh, the sites, the news uh, media outlets that are being um, attacked 
are those that specifically criticize not so much the Russian government, but Vladimir Putin himself. And so that's highly suspicious. But like you say, this is a this is always shadowy. This is why it's an appealing way to attack a, a political appoint, opponent, because you can't ever get to the root of what's going on. I mean, there, there have been massive ha attacks coming from China over the last like four or five years. And there's a lot of kind of smoking gun suspicion that these groups are orchestrated by either the Chinese government or the Chinese military. It's not clear uh, the, the link is not clearly establishable, if that's a word. And it's not even uh, clear that the if it is associated with the Chinese military, that this is sort of happening with permission by the Chinese government. So it's it's really a, a great way to attack an opponent uh, semi-anonymously, and you can deny everything while you watch their website go down. And I hope this, uh, uh, this, um, this type of attack doesn't uh, spread and become more competent because it would just be awful for pretty much every sort of political media site for banks, for government websites and so on to be in a constant state of attack. Uh, it just be hard to get stuff done. And uh, well, you, you know, you, you also don't necessarily need a government to do this. It can be right. somebody who simply sympathizes with a particular cause, you know, uh, while I think a lot of the West paints Putin as uh, as not a sympathetic figure, there are people there who are real partisans who are real loyal to him. And all it would take, you know, is, is one guy with, uh, with serious skills to uh, do some serious damage. And that's a great point. It's not always uh, uh, black or white. It's not always clear what the exact affiliation is, and sometimes it's just a supporter or a group of supporters. Well, in a sec, we're going to talk about a, uh, new, uh, a new hardware product on the gaming scene coming up this year almost for certain. But first, I want to tell you about Shutterstock. Shutterstock is a fantastic site where you can buy, uh, you know, uh, high quality stock photos and also illustrations vectors video clips you name it shutterstock.com is the place to go for uh, the highest quality images now if you want a creative if you have a creative project if you have advertising if you have a business if you're doing marketing materials if you have a website or a blog uh, any sort of uh, situation where you need a super great wow look at that if you're watching the video we're looking at blueberry pie that is just incredible. Uh, they have such fantastic uh, pictures. I've been using them for quite a while on my own blog, and I always, always find exactly the pic perfect picture. Sometimes the only difficulty is choosing from among multiple perfect pictures. They add 20,000 20, new images every single day. So if you've been there recently, come back again today, you'll find a whole bunch of new pictures. And many of these are created by professional photographers. Many of them illustrate concepts. Many of them illustrate events, uh, brands, uh, all kinds of stuff. That I've often been surprised by exactly what, wow, look at that pecan, pecan pie. <laughs> That's incredible. Holy mackerel. Okay, so... Uh, Sorry. <laughs> it's very distracting. You know, there's pictures of pie on, on Shutterstock.com. But uh, um, anyway, so this, the, the great thing about Shutterstock to me, I think, and it's the mark of any good website, is it has a great search engine. You can search for all kinds of stuff. You can search not just for pie, but for pecan pie. You can search for I'm blueberry pie. I'm going to keep on searching for pie. Yeah, what is delicious. that search? That, that's the chocolate funny. cream pie. Chocolate cream pie. Oh, my God. Wow, that's, that's incredible. <laughs> uh, so... Uh, this is one way you can also celebrate National Pie Day. Um, they also have this fantastic light box tool where you can go in and sort of uh, set aside pictures for consideration. You can compare them side by side. And you can also share them. So it's really, really a great service. No credit card needed. Just start an account and begin using Shutterstock to help imagine what your next project could be like and save favorite images to a light box to review later. Once you decide to purchase, use the offer code TNT314. Why would you do that? Well... You get 20% off no matter which package you choose. That's Shutterstock.com. And for 20% off new accounts, use offer code TNT314. And we thank Shutterstock for their support of Tech News Today. Well, a, uh, a picture published by Dave Zatz um, on a website called Zatz Not Funny. See what he did there? Um, claims that it's a controller for an upcoming Amazon game console. The leak, if accurate, bolsters rumors that Amazon will soon ship a set-top box that also runs games. Joining us to talk about the prospects of an Amazon game console is Mike Futter, the news editor for Game Information Magazine and the guy who broke the Amazon game console story back in August. Am I pronouncing your name correctly, Mike? Yes. Okay, yes. One, 
Wonderful. Can you tell us briefly about uh, what we know at this point about a possible Amazon game system? When we broke the story back in August, we got a tip, followed it up with a number of different sources, um, and independently heard from all of them that uh, this is going to be an Android-based console, um, that it was going to have its own controller, which if you know, the pictures today uh, seem to support. Um, and that they were going to be making a big push into the gaming industry. And there's been a number of things that have happened along the way that have supported that. Um, most significantly, in February, they purchased a developer by the name of Double Helix. Uh, Double Helix worked with Microsoft on the Killer Instinct reboot. And most recently, they worked with Capcom uh, to reboot uh, a series called Strider. And that appeared on both new generation consoles. Uh, it appeared on last gen Xbox 360, PlayStation 3, and also PC. Um, so, you know, all the evidence continues to mount that uh, Amazon is looking to, to make a push. Uh, and, and the information that we've seen uh, suggests a set top box, although. I'm not entirely sure that it's going to end there. Um, when we originally broke the story, we talked about, um, you know, Amazon does a huge amount of business um, in the consumer electronics world and uh, has strong relationships uh, with, um, with manufacturers. And therefore, there could be some partnerships to be struck uh, between Amazon and whatever technology it's developing and those manufacturers for some baked in uh, features. Now, as a gaming writer, does it seem likely that Amazon could compete against the likes of Microsoft, Sony, Google, and others? Well, you know, Amazon has a lot of money. They've got a lot of resources. I think the skepticism that exists in the core gaming industry right now or the core gaming um, uh, consumer market is that there hasn't been a successful Android console yet. Ouya was the, uh, the kind of the biggest that we had heard of. Um, it had a huge Kickstarter push and has since pretty much fizzled out. They've uh, now are pushing into um, kind of a platform on other devices. Um, Mad Cats has a device. NVIDIA has the Shield, which um, has a following largely because of the ability to stream uh, from desktop and uh, laptop PCs that have NVIDIA cards in them. So it has that additional functionality that the others don't have. And then there's GameStick and others. So I think that there is a skepticism um, about Android as a primary gaming device, um, despite uh, its success in gaming as, you know, for phones and for tablets. But as a core gaming device, I think there, that uh, there is some, some healthy skepticism in the, uh, in the market. So Mike, with, with this particular device, it's also been rumored that this is going to be um, a streaming box for them for, for video, for their Amazon On Demand, that it might have uh, Netflix and Hulu as well on it. Um, and right now, you know, you have um, Roku, which has uh, casual games on it, and they're not, they're not great, but they're there. Do you see this device maybe as being more pushed as a entertainment box uh, or as, as opposed to a gaming box and gaming is secondary? I, I think that's entirely possible. I mean, we need to remember that Amazon does have an ecosystem already. They have their Kindle line and they have their own versions of uh, of apps that are designed for that and largely casual apps like Angry Birds. Um, you know, they do have a healthy uh, video streaming service. Um, I thought that yesterday's news about AppStream and the software development kit becoming available was particularly interesting. And one of the things that I noticed about that was in their uh, in their animated uh, demo that was on the website is they showed what looked to be a first person shooter. But if you go look at the frequently asked questions, um, they're actually really clear that first person shooters, head to head fighting games, things that require very low latency aren't going to be a great fit for that. Um, however, that they talked about that there might be uh, a split. So streaming some of the content, but also keeping some of it locally. Um, Given the media buttons on the controller, I think a streaming box makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, those definitely stand out, and you can see them right there on the bottom. Um, you know, those those definitely jumped out at me. But you know, the controller itself is looks kind of bulky. Um, it looks very similar to the Xbox uh, 360 design with the offset controllers, the button labeling. Um, you know, it's you know, Microsoft though spent a hundred million dollars on designing the Xbox One controller. I think 
just from looking at this, that this takes a lot of cues from OnLive's controller, um, and OnLive has has you know tried to make a go at cloud-based gaming and streaming the video uh, to a variety of devices. Um, they had their share of financial problems and have recently reemerged. Um, but if you look at that controller, there's a lot of similarities. The exception being that the OnLive controller has the parallel sticks versus the versus the offset sticks. So it looks like they could be going for something similar with the uh, with the media buttons. Now, Mike, if you um, if you sort of uh, imagine that they will use a similar strategy that they did for Kindle, that would mean they would use a forked version of Android. They would try to keep people off the Google, off Google's games and in, in place of their own, and and get people and sort of direct people to their own uh, game store, and um, and they would also probably subsidize it. When the Kindles first came out, they were losing lots of money on every single tablet. And the reason was that it's essentially a cash register for buying things on Amazon. And this game system could be another cash register. So let's just imagine, uh, that to taking this to its logical conclusion, that their gaming system was significantly less expensive. Let's say, you know, let's say it's $79 to buy it or something like that. Would this influence the public to choose this game system over others or this television streaming box or or whatever it's going to be over others is price a big big deal i mean we we've seen the uh, the uh, difference between xbox and playstation and um you know recent reports with the xbox one sales indicate that it's higher price is not a big deal what do you think <laughs> Uh, I, I think you're right, and I think yesterday's MPD report backs that up. Um, you know, they last month. Um, so, looking at the January MPD report, there were about twice as many PlayStation 4s sold as Xbox One units. Last month, that gap uh, drastically narrowed. So, there were about over 90% of the PlayStation 4 number sold of Xbox Ones. So, there, so there, that gap is is really narrowing, and the price difference um, is becoming less of an issue than people originally thought. When they were both announced, I think people thought that $100 difference was gonna be kind of a big deal. But I also wanna point out that that most, if not, with the exception of a, of a few in recent history, most consoles are subsidized. Um, they are sold as loss leaders, uh, and then the money is made up on the software and software licensing. So for Amazon to undercut uh, drastically, um, and even undercut um, some of the other uh, my uh, Android consoles that are out there, I, I totally see that as, as as possible, and they've got the the wherewithal to do that. Um, they have been very successful with the Kindle line. They do understand how to pilot uh, a piece of hardware and then bring people into their own store. Um, I, so I think the scenario that you laid out makes a lot of sense and seems to be the way that they would go. Although you know they're coming in at a time when. Um, I suspect that Apple also is going to introduce a, uh, a version of Apple TV that has games, although uh, the rumors are now that that'll come uh, mid-year at the announcement, but you won't be able to buy it till the end of the year. Um, is, you know, right now it's a, it's, it is a fairly mature market uh, for gaming consoles, uh, given the fact that, that this device probably won't be able to run Google's Android games or Google's Android apps. Is it too late even for somebody with uh, with um, uh, Amazon's marketing muscle to come in and make a serious dent, particularly to win the hearts and minds of developers who are already kind of scattered? I, I think one of the biggest problems with development for Android is, is the fragmentation. And I think that the further you fragment, the harder it is for developers, which is where that app stream comes in, um, you know, Yesterday, Amazon really pushed the whole idea of you've got this one centralized version and then you update that and it pushes out to all the other devices. So if they're going to be tying those two together, then it's attractive for developers because they're, they have to test against less versions or fewer versions. So, I mean, the market is mature, but if the mobile push taught us anything is that there is still new audience out there and there's still a market for these. And anybody who has a Kindle, already and as part of that that ecosystem my guess is those apps are gonna are gonna pour it over um we you know we've seen a controller if it's a set top box and um app stream is also about streaming uh, other kinds of apps not just games then a wireless keyboard that uses bluetooth or a wireless mouse could also be used for it well so, mike, 
Mike, I want to thank you for coming on, and I also want to thank you for canceling your meeting in order to be here. <laughs> Apologies I'm... to whomever you canceled on. <laughs> it's okay. They will forgive me, I think. Okay, wonderful. Uh, thanks again. Well, you can find Mike's work on GameInformer.com, and you can find him on Twitter at Futterish, F-U-T-T-E-R-I-S-H. Great, thank you. Asus Tech, Tech announced earlier this year a new tablet called the Transformer Book Duet TD300. What was different about this tablet is that it was a dual boot device right out of the box running both Android and Windows. Intel's CEO, Brian Cranich even showed the device during his CES keynote, if you recall. Uh, and can we play the, a little bit of that, uh, Jason? This is a great announcement. And, it, and you can see that Intel is very excited about it. Windows for some usage, Android for others. I'm happy to announce the availability of the dual OS platform. Okay, now he's coming over. He doesn't actually announce the name of the product, but that's what he's showing. He's showing the, the Asus Tech uh, device. Uh, now, uh, we learned this morning that Asus Tech has postponed and may cancel this product after being pressured by both Microsoft and Google, according to a story in the Wall Street Journal. Uh, this is really fascinating to me, Dwight, because it seems to indicate a kind of rift between, you know, the, the rift between Asus Tech is one thing, but it seems to be a rift between Intel and Microsoft. I mean, here Intel is announcing a an initiative uh, for dual booting at CES in a very public way using the CEO on the one hand. And on the other hand, Microsoft is reportedly pressuring Asus Tech precisely because they're doing that. They're doing a dual, dual boot. At least that's what the Wall Street Journal article seems to indicate. Uh, what do you think? Is there is there trouble uh, in paradise between Microsoft and Intel? I think there's always been tension uh, between Microsoft and Intel. And I think it's, you know, they're increasingly, particularly as Microsoft does its own hardware, um, it, it Microsoft is going to continue to have these kinds of tensions with uh, with various partners. But I also think it may just be uh, some a little bit of reality here. Name any other device that dual boots natively that has been any kind of a success. There have been a handful of Dell devices that did it. There have been some HP devices where you could boot into a, a subset of Linux and people just don't use it. It's not, it's not something I think people actually want. Um, it's, great, it's a great idea in theory, particularly if you're an Android enthusiast and you want to get it out there or if you're a geek and you want to have the opportunity to run both. But I think 90% of people just look at it and go, you know, why would I do that? The closest thing I think you've seen to anything that's had any kind of a success is Apple with its boot camp. But I'm not really sure how many uh, Windows instances actually run uh, boot camp. I think most people even there primarily run uh, OS X. Now, there are a couple of interesting points uh, uh, supporting this story. One of them is that companies like Microsoft, and this is a little known fact, supply the lion's share of the marketing budgets for o for OEMs like Asus Tech to sell their products that if they're running Windows, obviously. And so it's pretty easy for companies like Microsoft to pressure OEMs into changing their behavior. And in this case, their pressure seems to paid off in, in concert with Google's pressure. Uh, it's also an interesting point that Sa Samsung announced a dual OS tablet last year and it hasn't begun selling it yet, and it's not really clear whether that will see the light of day. Yeah, uh, I just don't think there's any demand for that. You know, I think people I think that people look at that, and and maybe even the announcement is a chance to test the waters to see what kind of reaction they'd get. But I think it's just people have no interest. Uh, real people have no interest in that. Well, I think you're right about that. Well, Sprint announced a new prepaid wireless plan, and the Wall Street Journal said it just may be the worst deal ever. Called Sprint Prepaid, the plan charges you $45 a month and you get unlimited voice and text, but no cellular data. All the internet surfing on the plan has to be done over Wi-Fi. This sounds like a, a re they're right. This is a rotten deal. Uh, Dwight, what do you think? Uh, why are they doing this? Well, I, you know, there are a lot of people who are interested, who are around Wi-Fi all the time. And I think, you know, when I'm here at work, I have Wi-Fi. When I uh, get home, all I have is Wi-Fi. When I'm in transit... Between the two, I would need cellular data. But, you know, for example, my wife uses almost none of her cellular data, and she has, um, she has Wi-Fi in both, in both work at home. And I think that's what Sprint is thinking about. They're thinking about the um, people who may perhaps be interested in being on a budget or may perhaps be um, uh, around Wi-Fi constantly. 
and that's good, but the pricing for everything else is not, uh, doesn't match that idea. You know, it's, it, you would think that, th that they would take this uh, and drop this price a lot lower than that. The concept, I think, may have some um, value, but I don't think that the pricing does at all. I think you're absolutely right. Republic Wireless, for example, which buys access to Sprint's network wholesale and resells it to customers, offers unlimited voice and text, essentially the same plan, for $10 a month. That's $35 less per month using, you know, essentially the same service. Uh, a new, uh, th there's, a, there's a subsidiary, uh, Virgin Mobile USA. They sell a plan for $35 a month that restricts users to 300 minutes of talk time, but it comes with unlimited mobile data. So the pricing that for this, just as you said, uh, Dwight, is way out of whack with what's going on. I have a pr uh, I'll make a, a minor prediction here that they're going to backtrack on this and they're going to, uh, to, to stop offering this deal sometime within the next few months. But we'll, we'll be watching that. This is just a rotten deal, and I don't know who, where they're going to find suckers uh, to, I, well, to buy into I, this. I think one thing you can say that's a positive is that at least you have wireless companies trying things like this. You have them coming in and going, let's structure this uh, differently. A lot of that I think you can chalk up to the disruption that T-Mobile has brought to the market. Uh, uh, these carriers before wouldn't even have been willing to kind of step out of the box like this. And at least uh, Sprint is taking a chance. What I'd like to see them try is to not offer the phone service and have all the phone happening over IP. And that would be uh, a sort of glimpse into the, into the future. And, and I wish they would optimize phones for that, uh, for that usage. Well, you know, I get a lot of questions from uh, people who uh, still ask, can I get an iPod Touch and use it as a phone with Wi-Fi? And, of course, the answer is yes, if you, if you have the right apps. But uh, I hear that question a lot, and I think there is a demand out there for it. Absolutely. Well, in other news, Symantec researchers spotted a phishing scam for the record books recently. The email arrives with the subject documents and tells the recipient to look at files on Google Docs and conveniently provides a link. Here's the crazy part. The fake page is hosted on Google's own servers and is served up over SSL. The scammers simply uploaded their file to a public folder on the Google Drive account, and once the file is clicked on, the victim is confronted with a standard-looking Google login. Once the victim enters their username and password, the credentials are whisked away to a PHP script on a compromised web server for later use by hackers. That's a brilliant scam, and it's uh, hard to believe that uh, somebody didn't think of that earlier. Yeah, right. Why? Why didn't? They? I mean, you don't you don't want them to, but why didn't they think of that before? That's kind, of, and, and it's a. It's a real hole in the way uh, Google Docs works. Google Docs is incredibly convenient, but of course, you know, the, the truism is in tech that the more convenient it is, the less secure it is, and here's proof. That's right, super convenient for the hackers. Right. <laughs> well, in a minute, I'm going to give you some good news, but first I want to tell you about ShareFile. ShareFile is an awesome site that lets you share documents over the Internet via email without doing the wrong thing which is to attach it as an uh, to, to add it as an attachment now here's an, here's a funny uh, fact I learned this morning uh, I started using uh, share file some time ago my wife saw me using it and she fell in love with it and she started using it and she had been using it to exchange uh, financial documents with our accountant getting ready for tax season and now our our tax guy is using it when he saw that she was using it he was blown away by it, and now he's using it for all his clients. It's spreading like a virus, I tell you, because it's so easy to use, it's so secure, and it gives you peace of mind. Yes, it's secure. I mean, there's, it's, it's fantastic. You know, this is from Citrix, after all, so it's highly secure. And yes, you can send gigantic documents, multiple gigabytes in size, and these will go right into corporations that have very strict limits on file sizes for attachments because, of course, in the email itself, it's merely a link. And so that's a great way to get back. But the thing I like about it best is the peace of mind it gives you because it informs you what's going on with your attachment. If you send something to someone, it will come back and tell you when they opened it. You can control how many times they opened it. You can, of course, control who gets to open it. You know, lots of people use this because they have very large files. Other people use ShareFile because they want to convey s uh, secure documents. I think uh, uh, everybody who tries this will use it for all kinds of, of, of file sharing simply because it's so fast, easy, convenient, and for what it's worth, it's a beautiful website, and it's very aesthetically pleasing to use. And, and some people don't care about that, but I do. I think it's fantastic. So sign up today, and for a 30-day free trial, there is no obligation at all. Go to sharefile.com, click on the microphone at the top of the homepage, and enter TNT. 
And remember, visit sharefile.com and don't forget to type in TNT to sh show your support for this show, to tell them that you heard it from us. And also, we thank Sharefile for their support of Tech News Today. Well, uh, in some other good news, Pocket Drone looks like it's really going to fly. The mini tricopter is strong enough to carry a high-quality action camera, and it folds up smaller than a 7-inch tablet. The company called AirDroids just ended their Kickstarter campaign with nearly a million dollars in funding, the most popular drone project ever crowdfunded. Their initial goal was $35,000. Pre-orders begin in April, and the drone should ship in the fall, and I am getting one. This looks like a really great project. They show a GoPro camera in the, in the, uh, in the advertisement for the uh, product on the Kickstarter, and that's exactly what I suspect most people use it for. Well, Dwight, I want to thank you for being on Tech News today and being our guest co-anchor. Thank you for having me. I had a great time. And where can people find your work? They can find me at uh, on the uh, website of the uh, Houston Chronicle at blog.cron.com slash tech blog. And they can follow me on Twitter. I'm D Silverman. Wonderful. Well, there are lots of ways to subscribe to Tech News Today. You can subscribe to both the video and the audio podcast at twit.tv slash TNT. You can subscribe to our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash tech news today. You can follow us on Twitter, Tech News Today TV, and you can join our Google Plus community and also circle our G Plus page by searching for Tech News Today on Google Plus. And finally, don't forget to subscribe to our subreddit at technewstoday.reddit.com. You can also contact us by leaving voicemail, call 260-TNT-SHOW, and don't miss our evening newscast, Tech News Tonight, tonight at 4 p.m. Pacific and every weeknight. My name is Mike Elgin. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you Monday.